Welcome to The Engineering Room, a monthly series of long-form conversations with influential people from the software world. The Engineering Room is a series sponsored by Equal Experts, and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. So if you'd like some help building some great software or are interested in finding a great place to work, do check out their links in the description below. My guests today should need no introduction whatsoever, particularly to viewers of this channel, but actually to anybody involved in software development. Even if you haven't been paying a lot of attention for the past 25 years, and for some unfathomable reason don't know who he is, you will certainly know and probably have been significantly impacted by his ideas. He's one of the fathers of agile development, and as part of that group, for me at least, his ideas most closely represented the truth, the engineering core of what it takes to actually do good work rather than only plan to do good work. Uh, but he also introduced the modern world to ideas like continuous integration, test-driven development, pair programming, and many, many others. He also spoke about the values that matter in software development, simplicity, feedback, courage, respect, and the idea that I still regularly find new value in that of embracing change. This man has had a profound influence on our industry and certainly on my work and career. Please welcome Kent Beck. Thank you so much, Dave. It's a pleasure to finally get to talk with you. It's a pleasure. Our paths haven't crossed before, although you know we've been we've been hanging out with some of the same people in some <laughs> in similar places for for some years. It, I'm very very pleased to welcome you here, and, and thank you for agreeing to chat with us today. I, I'm I'm really interested in your ideas on you know, on lots of different things, and we've probably got too many things to talk about. But one place, okay, just no, no, go ahead. Yeah, the list you sent was uh, was a little daunting. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not going to go into all of that detail. I don't think it's it's, it's just uh, it's just my brain dump at the time. Uh, one sure. place I'd like to start, given my introduction, I, how do you feel these days about being introduced as one of the fathers of agile development, which, which clearly you were? Well, in fact, I'm uh, I'm the first signatory of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, alphabetically <laughs> um i've uh i've not really banked on that to a to a large degree uh, i i thought it was an interesting snapshot in time it set a lot of energy into motion um mostly as i see it it's been i'm back to saying the same stuff that i said 30 years ago Mm -hmm. and people treating it like it's novel and brand new. And so I, part of me is like, well, did, didn't we, did we make no progress? Um, but another part of me says, yeah, I mean, we've made some progress, but the things that haven't changed that are really significant are, are the power structures around software development. And yeah. it, until those change, the, the, the test-driven developments of the world and the continuous integrations of the world are shadows cast by the power structure. And you can't change the shadow without changing the reality. And uh, that's kind of where it feels like to me. There's still so much potential in software development that's unrealized. And yet it's the human problems that we need progress on if we're going to actually make any fundamental lasting change. Yeah, uh, it, I, it, it seems to me that it's kind of an interestingly, uh, uh, one of the reasons that I enjoy, have enjoyed my career in software development is that it seems to me that it's, it's quite a deep profession. There, there are some kind of profound ideas and truths at the heart of software development you know this idea of dealing with this ephemeral stuff called information and and that seems like you know modern physics think you know he's starting to see that as a fairly deep and profound idea in its own right but the oh, one of the ideas that i i i i i've thought for a while now that the ad the agile movement so i think it has had a positive impact but i'm i'm starting to think of it more a bit like you know, Newtonian mechanics versus general relativity. It was it was a, a rough, a good approximation of where we need to get to, but it wasn't kind of the, you know, that that more things came will come later. That kind of refine our picture of some of those things, but there's there's still deep truth in it. So so that, that I, there's nothing that I would, you know, I I still tell people to go and read the Agile Manifesto and say, 
you know, if you want to know what agile is about, look at that. And when you're doing all of that, let's talk again. You know, it's you know that's that's the starting point. It seems to me. So so uh, one of one of the big positives I would say that that you and your your colleagues that you know the original signatories have made the other middle aged the- white guys. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All, all, all those middle aged white guys in, <laughs> involved are, is the, 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 but the impact is that you know. 25 years ago, if you'd asked any organization on average, unless they were weird like yours or mine, you know, they, they would have said, oh, yes, we're doing waterfall. And now they don't. <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's back. It's back, Dave. I mean, maybe this is a Silicon Valley thing, but I I hear smart people unironically say, well, the first thing you have to do is do a, a thorough survey of the market opportunity. Yeah. And then the design organization produces the wireframes. And then the programmers do that. And that's how you build successful software. And and it's just not. And n- no successful software has been built that way. No, nothing that has had yeah. any kind of outsized impact. And yet that's exactly the waterfall. Yes. And the, there's new na- new words put to it, but it's it's the same sequence, the same, and it doesn't work for all the reasons that it never worked. And yet the fiction is so attractive that people are going to return to it. Yeah, I I I I, I certainly think I, I certainly agree that it never went away. <laughs> I, I I haven't I haven't seen I haven't seen the kind of resurgence so, so the way that i would i would have said i would have put it was that the um the way that i would have perceived it was that was that you know most organizations pay lip service to working in an agile way but really under the covers we're still doing the same old things that aligned nicely with how you know non-technical management structures in the organization thought things worked it's not only their yeah, fault they... I'm, not, I'm not trying to blame managers and not technologists it's it's our fault too but but, oh, absolutely. But um... yeah, so the, the change I've seen in the past five or 10 years is is there was a period where, yeah, you would be ashamed to say something that was obviously yeah. waterfally. And n- now people say it as if they should be proud of it. <laughs> OK, I, well, maybe, uh, I, I, I haven't seen that yet and I hope that I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> but 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 c- certainly, c- certainly, you know, they, I don't think, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think the fight against waterfall has gone away because, oh no, you know, that's. I suppose when you think simplistically, it, it, it's alluring. It would be nice if you could sure. make all these perfect predictions of the future. It's just that you can't. I, I remember one of my early extreme programming workshops. The guy, arms folded on the front row but arms folded, and this was in Denmark, just all day long, just skeptical, skeptical, skeptical. And then right at the end of the day, just as things were winding down, his hand goes up. And I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, uh, you know, and I've been going through all the embrace change, you know, extreme programming, embrace change. That's really, that is the heart of it. And I've been going through all the different ways that we embrace change in extreme programming. And so this hand goes up and he says, wouldn't it be easier to just do it right the first time? <laughs> I said, yes, yes, sir, it would. And that's just not one of my options. So I have to adapt. But sure, it would be easier to do it right the first time. If you knew what it was, and you knew how to do it right, and the target didn't change, and the team did on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> There's lots of reasons why that's a, an absurd statement. Yeah, and yet, sure, it would be easier. That's 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 one of the one of the ideas. I I, I read this book a few years ago, which I, which I I mentioned a few times to, to friends and on here occasionally. It's it's a it's a book about physics. It's a book about the philosophy of science by a guy called David Deutsch from um, from uh, Oxford. Uh, he's a professor, uh, and he he basically in, invented the idea of quantum computation in the sense of coming up with algorithms and stuff. So Feynman and Stiff did the original 
idea but the but david deutsch is a you know he's a smart he's a brilliant guy but he wrote this he wrote this amazing book called the beginning of infinity and he was talking about science as being driven by good explanations and being you know um there are some ideas that are kind of infinite in scope and one of the examples he gives in the book is the difference between pictorial versions of writing and alphabetic versions of writing if you you know a, a pictorial version of writing is fine as long as you and i both know the symbol for a particular word and then it's not fine if i use a symbol that you've never seen before or you speak a word that i don't know the symbol for um, whereas alphabetic mm -hmm. writing is that we try and mimic the sounds and so we can write down a word we all spell it wrong. we might spell it wrong but we can write down a word that we've never seen um you can speak a word that you've never heard before and, and those sorts of things so he said you know th th that's one of the ideas and and to me one of the big steps of agility beyond waterfall was that it was one of those steps to infinity if i start a project on day one and I've got no bloody idea about you know, what the customers really want, which is the truth, and, uh, and, and, and what to do next, which is usually the truth. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to work to try and find those things out and discover and learn. That's kind of an open-ended way of working. Whereas if I start off a waterfall, ultimately, if I've got to start off with a plan, I am fundamentally somehow limited to, you know, the scope of my brain, the scope of, you know, the organizational context in which I can come up with that some some v narrow version of that perfection that your, your your Danish student was talking about. So it's right. it's I, I I liked that idea because I th I think that's I think that's that's one of the things that seems so I still talk in terms of you know the the, the importance of agile for those reasons. And I, 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 well, I, I, sure, and and the the balance of the value that you already have in the your head versus what you're going to discover. Yeah changes how valuable it is to discover new things if, if you if you already know pretty much everything and nothing new is going to come up then yeah. go ahead and think really hard that's fine i just never find myself in those situations so i'm just going to assume that what i don't know is vaster and far more valuable than what i do know yeah and if I organize development around that principle, then anything that looks like a legible, easily understood model is has to be wrong. Yes. Because that's focused on what I already know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's but that's also uncomfortable, right? Because it's uh, like, it, well, it, what, it, what, it, what are you going to discover? Well, <laughs> It's it's it seems to be, but I I I I I don't. One of the, one of the things I I I've been I, I tend to do a little bit of research on the people that I'm going to be talking to, so I'll kind of see you know the things that they've been talking about and writing about that I haven't caught up on or whatever. And doing doing that for some of your stuff, it, it just brought home to me that one of the things, one of the reasons why I've enjoyed your work so much for so long is inevitably that it aligns really nicely with my worldview. That's, you know, I'm a, I'm a human being and that's one of the things that we tend to like. But but I but I, I think that one of the things that I think, I, I think putting words in your mouth that we would both believe very strongly in is organizing software development as a, as a kind of incremental process of learning. We're, we're going to, we're going to, you know, search for for better answers all of the time and and build on what we know and try and try and figure out whether what we know is right or wrong and then and then move on but on the basis of what we've learned there and, and so on and so on and that seems to be deeply involved in the way that you you think and talk about things yeah i quickly learned that i created more value if i focused on learning yes than on when I was a kid, the software factory was a metaphor that, okay, this is how we're going to solve the problems of software yeah. is we're going to have a software factory and it'll all be legible. You know, I love that seeing like a state a me metaphor of legibility. It'll all be legible and there'll be stages and you'll have predictable inputs and predictable process and predictable <laughs> output. And if I just treat this like a college course where I don't know what I'm going to learn, because if I knew what I was going to learn, then I wouldn't be learning it. Yeah. If I just treat it as a course instead of a factory, 
and I celebrate the things that I learn. And of course, we're going to spin out some running software because if we don't actually get the software to run, we don't have the feedback to actually learn. Yeah. So yes, of course, there'll be some software, some features that come out of this and some structure that comes out of this. But if we uh, uh, set things up to maximize learning instead of production, the value produced goes way, way up. Yes. Yes, uh, com completely. And, and, and that's, that's, what, that's one of the ideas in, 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 in my recent book about what I think software engineering is about, you know, which is you know, learning is an absolute cornerstone. And, you know, and we, we, as professionals, you know, we should be optimizing to be really great at learning. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, would, I would put, you know, that's at the heart of, of some of the key ideas that, that you spoke about you know, all those years ago in extreme programming explained uh you know test driven development continuous integration pair programming those sorts of things seem to me very deeply you know grounded in our you know our ability to to just learn things and discover them quickly in short little short little small steps and then we can kind of you know react to what it is that we find <clears throat> um so so talking about test driven development on on your personal website you you say that you're the rediscover the rediscoverer of test driven development. I, I think many people would think of you as the you know the, the, the test driven development being you know being your invention and your or your team's invention at C three at least. Um, oh no, it, it predated C three okay. by by a good bit. So that okay. was that one was definitely mine. So the reason I say rediscoverer um, when I started talking about test driven development. I'd have these old programmers, uh, I'm old now, so I can use the word old, would come up to me and say, well, of course you work this way. Yeah. If you didn't know what the outputs should be, you have no business programming. Yeah. We used to do that all the time. And for me, the genesis of the, of the idea, like the germ of the idea was a book I had read as a kid. My dad was a programmer. He'd bring home books about programming. I would read them obsessively. I was that Silicon Valley kid. And one of those books said, how you program is you have the input tape and you know what the output tape is supposed to look like. So you type in the output tape and you keep programming until that's the output tape that you get. So I'd had that seed planted when I was nine or 10 or something like that. Uh, then I wrote the first uh, uh, X unit style testing framework. And somehow I put those, those two ideas together. So th that idea had been around for a long time. Then when I started talking about TDD and given it a name and was talking about it more, then people said, oh, well, Project Mercury, the, the software for the yeah. Mercury spacecraft, was written exactly that way. We didn't program until we had expected outputs. Yeah. Of course not. And then we would program until the actuals match the expecteds, and then we could go to the next thing. And you would never change the program without first changing the expecteds so that you knew when you were finished. Of course you would work that way. So yes, like it, 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 it came to me in a way uh, and the the granularity that people tend to use in TDD is much smaller than than it was in those earlier days. But yeah. the workflow, that inversion of the of the artifacts, test first and then code, that was wisdom from the sixties. Yeah. And, and that was ex ex that was something that you, you that you knew beforehand. You you didn't find that out later. You, that, you, that, you didn't say, "Oh, I thought I came with up with that," but somebody, <laughs> somebody else did. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah. I mean, this isn't science. Precedence doesn't really matter. Sure. For us, no, so. no, no, yeah. So, 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 sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to belittle that. I was. I was just wondering about the genesis. I, 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 I was. Um, 
I, I, I came to that 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 learn. So I, I read the um, I read some of the stuff from the 1968 engineering com software engineering conference, and Alan Perlis has a long bit, you know, that talks about test driven development, you know, in, in some detail in 1968. And and then I heard about the Mercury stuff, which was even earlier, sort of late 50s, yeah. early 60s kind of tech. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating, but I, but I I didn't know that you know I, I learned test driven I learned the idea of test driven development from you really. What I, I was doing I was doing automated testing and a version of continuous integration before I read the extreme uh, programming book. But one of the revelations for me was actually X unit. The first time I saw I, I was working in Java by then, and and I saw J unit. I thought ah. Oh, I get it now <laughs> because we'd, we'd still been trying to build tests that were too big and too complicated. And as soon as I saw Jay, Oh yeah, of course, you know, that's so, so much more elegant and simple. Yeah. The, the, the decision that had massive consequences was representing tests in the source code of the language that you're testing. Yes. Always before I'd seen lots of testing tools and they always had some kind of scripting language. And, and uh, when I when I went to, I'd built some kind of testing framework maybe four or five times yeah. before I, I uh, wrote the first S unit in Smalltalk. And that idea of let me represent the tests in the source code. Yes. It's not, and it's it's kind of a it's kind of a cheat because if you look at the at a, a class full of tests, it looks like Java in JUnit. Yeah, if you look at JUnit tests, it looks like Java, but the semantics are completely different. Yes, it you're never going to call this function and then call that function and call that fun. It's it, it, it syntactically it's the same, but semantically it's completely different. And it's yeah. up to your test runner to figure out how to tease that apart and make sure that setup gets called and make sure that teardown gets called regardless and, and, and sequence things and build a new instance for every test and all, all that stuff. So it's, it, it looks like Java, but it's not really Java, but that one decision meant that it was much more approachable for programmers that it was the, the implementation was in a sense, almost free. Yes. As opposed to implementing a separate uh, uh, scripting language and that the many of the tools that worked with, uh, with your source code would also work with your tests yes. without anything else. So, th but that was a, that was a novelty at the time to represent the tests in the source code of the language that you were testing. Once, once I, you know, and I make, you make decisions like that in a hundred times, 99 times out of a hundred, they're going to be terrible decisions <laughs> for reasons that you have no idea of at the time. But that's that's the one out of a hundred that really made a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And and that was the the thing for me. As soon as I saw that, I thought, of course, that's brilliant. That's really, that's that's exactly how this ought to work. And and well, you it's always working on at the time. We we were do, we were doing. We were doing quite a lot of automated testing, but we were doing it at a higher level. And it, as I said, it was ugly and too complicated and all this kind of stuff. And then as soon as we saw that, we just dumped that and just start, and started doing proper test driven development and, and made all the mistakes that people do when, you, when they're learning TDD. But, but it, was, it was great. So that was, yeah, that was have, have you tried before. TCR yet? I haven't. I, I've I've watched you doing it on some of your videos on your on, on your channel and uh, and and, and, and link really link to appear here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we'll definitely do that. Um, it's it's an interesting idea and and make and makes sense to me. I, I kind of work that way anyway. <laughs> it's you know it's I kind of do a manual version of it almost. Is that if the test fails, you start again. And but yeah, they're very yeah, cool. absolutely. So, so for the people who haven't run, run into it yet, it's a variation on or a, a replacement for the TDD workflow. TDD workflow is this inversion of write the test and then write the code that makes it pass. Um, so in TCR, there there isn't it isn't that uh, rigid when you write the code and when you write the test. 
But if the tests ever don't pass, you revert to the last time the tests all passed, yeah. which creates this intense incentive to work in teensy weensy little steps. Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, well, here's four. And, oh man, the first time you, you do it and you write five lines of code and you're like, all right, that'll be good. Poof. And it just disappears. And you're like, what? No, no, no. That's I know that was right. So you write the same five lines of code and poof, it just disappears. And and eventually you realize, oh, well, all right. So I got five lines of code to write. If I write this line of code, that'll get me some feedback. If that doesn't work, yep. then I'm definitely on the wrong path. And then I can write these two lines. And so the 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 wheels really start spinning about the order in which you do tasks, which oftentimes we take as a given. I've got this whole thing. I have to stuff it all in my mouth all at the same time. And, and it's never true. There's yeah. always ways to take bites. But TCR is a way of, of uh, I'm not going to say forcing, incentivizing you to take small bites. You can still write five <laughs> lines of code all at once if you want to, if you want to see them disappear and then <laughs> try it over again. Uh, it, it really hasn't taken off in the same way, um, but that's okay. I'm used to ideas taking a while to cook, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it 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 it's a nice it, it's it's a nice idea, uh, definitely. I, I'm um, the 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 only bit that I'm skeptical about is that is is making test first optional. <laughs> I, I, well, I, yeah, and I, I, I sometimes pra I, I I'm I'm joking really because because sometimes mm. practically it is, but but mostly what you know the thing that I value probably most highly of all is the way it gives me that feedback on my design by trying to you know do the outside in thing of design you know designing by writing a test and so right you know that, you know, that that's one of the that's the one of the things that I'm just completely addicted to oh it's it's <laughs> yeah people so one of the things that bugs me when people people say well test driven development is not a testing technique the hell it isn't of course <laughs> it is yeah it's in the name it's in the artifacts you create. Those are tests. They pass or fail. Uh, oh, somebody somebody said we shouldn't talk about test passing or fail. We should talk about the system passing or failing. I don't know. I got to think about that one. All right. So the, it is a testing technique, but it's also a design technique because it yes. gives you fast feedback on the logical design, the API design of, of what you're working on. It's a, a, a specification technique, absolutely, because yeah. you have to write down your assumptions in a way that otherwise you wouldn't. But it's also a, a Xanax for programmers. Yeah. It's an anxiety reducing technique, which yeah. is what's most important to me yeah. is, you know, it, it just has fewer side effects than all the chemicals that you, you can ingest to, to get the same thing. It, it's a teamwork technique. A, yeah. a collaboration technique. Uh, sure, it's all of those things all together. So if you don't want to use it, it's fine. I, you know, I'll get people walk up to me and say, oh, well, you know, actually I don't do TDD. I'm like, why do I care? I'm not your, <laughs> I'm not your priest. Um, you don't want to do you mean, it, it's you, fine. You, don't, don't, you don't get a dollar for every test written. <laughs> I, not, I, I have yet to discover a way to collect on that one. And I sure wish I had, but there you go. Um, yeah. If I, if I had, I probably wouldn't have near the motivation to keep going the way I, the way I have. So it's a blessing, I suppose. Um, I, I, you you do you work test driven or or not fine, but you're going to have to solve all those problems. Yes, you're going to have to solve the testing problem, the yeah. the validation, the double checking of the behavior of the system. You're going to have to solve the design problem. You're going to have to solve the documentation problem. You're going to have to solve the collaboration problem, and you're going to have to deal with your anxieties. All those problems are still going to be there whether you test first or not yes so how you deal with them is fine or the degree to which you deal with them that's up to you but tdd is a way that like in a in a kind of a tractor sense 
that you have to go a ways to find a better way of dealing with all those problems. Yes. Uh, one of the things that, that I read that, that you've written, at least more recently from my point of view, I don't know when you wrote it originally, but um, <clears throat> was uh, the idea of um, separating the behavior from the outcome, which I think test-driven development helps you to do. Um, I hadn't heard... I missed a word there. Uh, separating the what from the outcome? The behavior from the outcome. So you, you, so so writing the test is all about is all about the behavior, and then re, you know refactoring and, and and so on is all about is all about you know refining the outcomes. So we we, we that that seems to me to play into this specification idea, this idea of tests as specifications, which which you know I, I think is an important idea to communicate to people to stop them getting into you know one of the common difficulties of you know welding everything together with overly coupled tests and so on but i i really liked that kind of insight because i, I think that's a, a such a powerful kind of thought in terms of you know what it is that's really going on here when you know if we're writing the test first what we're trying to do is that we're trying to you know assert that our system or our code whatever level that we're evaluating things at is delivering some behavior that we're interested in and then you know that should give us the freedom to separately you know play with and deal with different kinds of um structures uh, uh, that, that that we can change to 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 meet that need did i say outcome when i meant to say structure i, I, I meant to say yes. structure if i didn't say okay that. okay now mm -hmm. now the sentence makes sense yes behavior and structure is a, yes behavior that, that's a, a distinction that i make very strongly now i yes i'm writing the first in a series of software design books called, uh, and the first one's called Tidy First. Yeah. And uh, link in the description, right? Isn't that the YouTube -y thing to say? That is the YouTube -y uh, thing to slay. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> so I'm writing this book kind of, not kind of, in public. So the the paid subscribers get finished chapters as they, yeah. as they appear. And until I was writing this book, the... I would always talk about the two hats, you know, you're refactoring or you're changing the behavior of the system. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was writing the book that the the distinction between structure and behavior became uh, much clearer in my mind. And now I recommend that people, if you have to use a pull request code review model, which is a whole separate conversation about how stupid that is. Um, uh, uh, most in most contexts, how did, narrow I, the context is in which that's a smart way to work. There we go. Just, just the other YouTubey thing. I've got some nice videos that say exactly the same thing. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. good. Um, uh, and tell I, if you're going to have that kind of a model, only have structural changes or behavior changes in a, a pull request and never both at the same time. Now, I, I'm a fan of going to uh, something more like TCR where the code minute by minute is always deployable. And so the code is minute by minute deployed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a separate conversation. Yeah. I, 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 and yeah, you, you, you can kind of wind that to different degrees in different circumstances to get different sorts of value i think but 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 the whole idea that the, the, the thing the thing that you said earlier that, that that seems to me so core so central to all all of the stuff that i you know i've read from you and and heard you talk about really is this idea of making this pro process in small steps and so you know the smaller the steps the better there's a i was watching one of your conference presentations and 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 you you were saying about the early days of um uh, thinking about work you know working in small steps you say oh you know if if we could if we could get this to a state where we could you know we we could, we could do, you know uh, create something every month that would be great you know if we did all the design in a month and then then if we did it for a couple of weeks and if we did it for a week and then if we did it every day <laughs> and you're just bringing that time down and you know and at each stage your design got simpler at, at each stage it's right. easier to understand and at each stage you're getting you know more insight into what's really going on well all, all development is incremental yes 
If you have a, a thousand developers working on a system and you only release once a year, this is, you know, back in the bad old days, yeah. it was still incremental. It, you could, if you had the a godlike view of all of that activity, one line of code was being written at, being finished at a time. You know, yeah. if you had sufficiently fine-grained timestamps, you could you could linearize you linearize all the lines of code ever written by a thousand people in a year. It's just that the feedback wasn't incremental. Yes. And so the question is, <clears throat> how closely do you want to match the feedback cycle to the to the changes and yes. queuing theory suggests that y your your sensing loop and your controlling loop should be about the same size yeah so if you're changing code every 10 seconds if you have a new line of code every 10 seconds yeah. having feedback every 10 seconds would be would be ideal that's yes. that's the best you can get yes and yeah, for lots of reasons, people resist that. But um, as far as I'm concerned, we're not done until we get there. This is the, I, I call this limbo. Because the limbo song asks, how low can you go? Yeah. So this is how quickly can we, we make the deployment cycle? Yeah. And uh, uh, I think there's a long ways to go. This is another one of these ideas that's probably 20 years ahead of its time. But uh, that's Okay. You know, if people want to um, if you if people want to experiment with this, they could experiment with it today. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, you you get into you know from from you know, the stuff that, that that I talk about, you know, ideas like organizing for continuous delivery, continuous deployment, so that you can you can exercise that all the way into production, and you can you, you can just keep your eye. And as you say. Everything starts to get simpler as that batch size, that that size of change reduces because each change gets simpler and easier to reason about, easier to test, easier to isolate. You're controlling the variables. If I make this change and you make that change, which one is it that increased, you know, customer sign up? How do we tell? Well, if we release them one at a time, we can tell. <laughs> you know, it's it, everything becomes simpler when we go that way. I I, I guess the thing that doesn't the challenge. That people face which i assume is you know from what i've read of, of on your site of about your your new book books is is that the thing that doesn't really get simpler for many people is this idea of incremental design that seems very natural to me over time I, I, the way that you talk about it, it seems very natural um do you think that that's an inherently difficult thing or do you think that that's a thing that you know, we learn stuff the wrong way, and and so and so it's you know it's difficult to 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 change horses, or 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 is it is it just that you and me are weird? Well, that's certainly true. <laughs> I'm just not sure that that's relevant to the, this conversation. So I call this the salami slicing problem, right? So so in that story is all of software product development, as far as I'm concerned. You have you have two variables how thin are the slices and what order do you eat them yeah. i call it the succession problem so to your question is that a difficult problem partly i want to say it's an incredibly difficult problem sometimes to figure out the sequence that lets that that maximizes feedback that maximizes learning yeah that can be a, an incredible challenge um, and what makes it worse is that we just don't talk about it. I remember watching, a uh, 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 highway bridges get replaced. Uh, the, the freeway that I, I had to drive on a regular basis. So they built a temporary bridge. Let's see. What was the, they were actually replacing two bridges at the same time at like uh, five kilometers apart. And and the sequence was completely different because where they were, one in one case, they built a temporary bridge kind of in between the two bridges, and then they replaced one of them, and then they replaced the other one, and then they took the temporary bridge out. Mm -hmm. But in the other one, they were more constrained with the space, and so they had to have both, had to have traffic move to one bridge both ways you know reduced to one lane each way yeah 
and then they replace the other bridge and then they move the traffic to so somebody had to think about that none of that is strength of materials none of that has yeah. to do with the shape of the bridge but somebody had to think really carefully about the succession problem what yes. order are we going to do what activities so that we end up where we want to be i think the the part of the difficulty in software is we just don't talk about that succession problem we don't give it the same weight as we give to the descriptions of the structure so we'll talk about design patterns here's a here's a kind of microstructure that reappears over and over again that solves certain problems that reappear over and over again but we don't talk about succession we don't say all right you have five lines of code to write and you think the only way to do it is to write line one, two, three, four, five. That's four fingers and five lines of code. Sorry about that. <laughs> All the OCD people are going to be <laughs> tripping out. Sorry. I apologize. Um, so, but that's not necessarily the order in which the only order in which you can write those lines of code. Cause yeah. maybe you can write line four, feed a constant into it. And then double check to make sure that, that you're getting the same answer as you used to get. And that, 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 that you have n factorial ways yeah. of writing n lines of code. And we, we don't explore beyond one sequence. And so I, I think if we, if we made that a topic of conversation, if we started paying more attention to, oh, you know, here's a really cool way that you can write this before you write that, you might think that, yeah, but no, in fact, I think we'll we'll learn a lot about it. And there's tremendous value to be unlocked in exploring more of the space of those n factorial sequences uh, but yeah, currently we're just not doing it. So I think it is a really hard problem. It's to me, it's far more satisfying. Yeah. So, the, 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 so the, there were a couple of things that were going through my head as you were describing that. Well, one of them is, you know, the, the, there are lots of different solutions to that problem and <clears throat> it depends what you're optimizing for, which, you know, right. and I, it seems to me that often particularly more junior teams, but, 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 you know, some teams seem to struggle with the notion that there's one right answer sometimes to, 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 yes. be, able to, to be able to get to a solution. And there's never one right answer. There's always lots of different ways that we can go about it. And the other thing that was going through my hand, head as, as you were describing that, that's, that's kind of a follow on thought from that is <clears throat> I think one of the things that I recognize in myself, at least is that I am now, completely comfortable starting on something where i don't know what the end is I, I'm, right. I'm you know i'm i'm, I'm a, i've got confidence that i don't know what the end is but i know how to get there right. <laughs> and but and, and you get there by iterating iterating and experimenting and figuring out what your fitness function is that sees where you're closer to the destination or further away and all of those kinds of things and all of the stuff that you talk you know talk talk to, have talked about over the years seems to help us to be able to do that and make this progress in small chunks you know once again and so but, I, but that I, confidence I'm not, quite, I'm not quite sure whether it's the confidence or or, or or not you know maybe i'm overconfident but but i think that just having having the the feeling of being able to start when you don't know where the end point is well, I think that's the, isn't that what uh, any engineering is like, really. What you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's just acknowledging the reality of the situation. Yes, I, I think there's a there's a stage where you don't know how to write a program, and then you figure out a way to write a program, and then you think, oh, okay, so so there's one way, and I and don't don't confuse me with the alternatives, because like if I started thinking about the alternatives then uh, I'm going to lose the confidence that I can do anything. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But then eventually you realize, oh, no, it's okay. I, yeah, there's, there's lots of sequences that could, could result in the same thing. And I know one, let's find some more. This is why I love programming the same thing over and over again. Yes. Um. The, the TDD book has this multi-currency money example. 
And I have probably started that from scratch in I probably maybe 10 different programming languages and 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 built it all up from scratch 30 times. And like it was time number 28 and I found a completely new approach to it. That's the kind of thing I love playing with. All right. Yeah. So I know I've got 10 test cases that have to pass. What order should I cause? Should I address them? I don't know. Let me try it. Let me try. I'll start with this one or I'll start with that one. Or so, and different reasons would cause me to move certain of those test cases earlier in the sequence or later in the sequence. Part of the learning process is learning to sniff out, all right, well, which test is going to teach me the most? Yeah. Well, that's also going to change depending on what you already know. So yeah. let's let's try shuffling the deck, having the test come out in a different order and seeing what that does to our process, to our feelings, to our progress, to the finished product. I don't know. Which, it's, which, it's which, unpredictable. Which gets us really back to what we were talking about before, about this being a discipline of learning. And, and you, know, the, the, you know, we need the tools of exploration, really, to, to explore and play with ideas and figure out you know where we are and where we're going at any you know any given point yeah and i think it's that it's that when i'm talking a uh, teaching or coaching a, a kind of journeyman program or somebody yeah. who can get a program to behave a certain way but maybe only has one one path to get there that that re, re implementation is such a powerful technique because it's clearly a waste of time. Yeah, uh, the program's there and it works. Who cares? Yeah, we're not we're not asking whether we can do that. We know that we can get a program to behave in a certain way. Yeah, big deal. Let's let's open the space up of the ways we can get from here to there, and some of them will be better and some of them will be worse but consciously shaping the unfolding of the program as yes. opposed to just consciously shaping the program in itself, th that gives you so many more options for what and, you can and, do. And, so, and, and, yeah. and valuing the, the, the structures that we create and the, you know, the, the shapes that we're building in the software, really, the, the, the you know, the, um, I, 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 the other part of my my engineering idea is, you know, the the other part of our discipline is managing complexity, and we do that through tools like cohesion coupling, abstraction, separation of concerns, and uh, you know, and modularity and those sorts of things, which <clears throat> seems to me, you know, quite a lot of the the meat of your new book, talking about that that kind of level of ideas and so on, but you know, but and. Almost, you know, when I'm I'm a software guy, and and if if you explain a problem to me, I'm immediately imagining solutions, and I'm always too embarrassed. I'm not going to mention any of them to anybody because they're they're all way too embarrassing to start with. You know, there's some kind of quality that we're going to apply to 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 our designs, our, our solutions that we value that allow us to, you know, maybe make this more incremental progress that we've been talking about and. I, 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 one of the things that I've been saying in public for a little while now is that I'm starting to think that, you know, that the fundamental measure of quality in software is our ability to change it. You know, everything else is secondary right. to do that. You know, if you want it to, you know, you, you, of course, you want it to be secure and fast and all those sort of things, but you don't get those things if you can't change it. So optimizing to allow us to be able to change it is, you know, table stakes and i'm going to de i'm going to prefer designs that maintain my ability to change it and i don't mean over engineering i just I, yeah I just yeah, yeah yeah okay okay you knew you knew where i was where my I face did. was going with that one i did I, I i'm i'm absolutely not talking about designing for the future i'm designing absolutely for now but i'm just going to leave the door open you know if if there's a there's a seam in my code here and you know i'm talking to a database i don't want to know the detail of the database i'm just going to talk to it and i'll write a little bit of code that talks to the database and that'll be the bare minimum that i need for right now the problem that i'm facing right now but i just want to have some shapes in it and prefer those sorts of structures that are going to allow me to keep to change it keep to test it and all those sorts of things as i go forward right. <clears throat> 
Yeah. It, again, this depends on where where are we on the trade off between yeah. we know where the value lies and we don't know where the value lies. Yes. Where, if the 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 predicted value and the re, uh, revealed value. Yeah. If predicted value is most of the value, and we're going to learn a little bit, then sh sure, fine, do things in big chunks because yeah, you're not getting you're not going to find out anything anyway. But it's just never the case. The, yeah. the trade off, the the revealed value is always many, sometimes many orders of magnitude greater than the predicted value. Yes. And if you get into one of those situations and you want to take advantage of the opportunity, you're completely on the side of how are we going to, how are we going to both discover and then exploit the, uh, these new sources of value that we just never expected. Yes. Yes. So, 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 so we've kind of, wandered into what feels to me like more of the territory of your new your new series of books could you just t tell us a little bit about what you know what they're about and what what your what your plan is for for for, for these I, i'm looking forward to reading them and i'm you know i'm going to become a subscriber so i can start reading the first one. Oh, thank you uh -huh. um so so in 2005 i was on a panel with ed yordan and larry constantine celebrating the 25th i think anniversary of the publication of the of the book, uh, Structured Design, yeah. which was the book that introduced the notions of coupling and cohesion. Yes. And those notions were empirically derived from programs at IBM, <clears throat> some of which were easy to change or cheap to change, and some of which were very expensive to change. And so coupling and cohesion were observations about what was in common between all of the programs that were relatively easy to change. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd had that book as a college textbook. So of course I hadn't read it. So in preparation for this panel, I started reading it again for the first time. And I was just blown away. This is Newton's laws of motion for software development. Yeah. And we missed it. We missed the point the first time through. So I set for myself the task of rewriting that material for a modern audience. Yeah. So there's not a description of paper tape and assembly language versus higher level languages and, and, and things like that. So that's 2005 is a long time ago, but it takes me a while. Um, so I finally really got going maybe four years ago. I, 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 I've got 10,000 words that I liked. Um, and then about a year ago, uh, I, I knew that I needed incentive to just do the writing. Because what, what takes me a long time to write things is not how slow I go when I go. It's how often I don't go at all. Yeah. And so I wanted some incentive. So I started uh, a paid sub stack so that I would uh, owe somebody $7 worth of some kind of writing on a regular yeah. basis. And it, uh, lo and behold, that really works for me. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I sat down to write the, these books and uh, the first sentence off of my fingers was, uh, software design is an exercise in human relationships. Mm -hmm. I went, what? What does that mean? That I, I, I didn't, I had no idea what I meant by that. <laughs> so the process has been me discovering what I meant by that <laughs> phrase. But the longer I go, the more I realize, yes, yeah, software design is an exercise in human relationships. We talk about it in terms of the relationships of the, the elements in our design and coupling and cohesion and so on. But really w the difference between good design and bad design has much more to do with the relationships between the people involved than it does between this system calling that system and the tail latency, blah, 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 blah. Because yeah. if, 
if the human relationships are healthy, we can work out all the technical stuff. And if the human relationships are dysfunctional, Conway's, this is like Conway's darkest uh, uh, implication is if the relationships are sick, the software is sick. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it sounds like you write like I do. <laughs> oh, sure. That's why I write. A, a brain dump. And then you think, what the hell did I mean by that? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's why I write. Um, uh, but, but, but I... I, I I, I, I was trying to figure out as you as you were saying that whether um i i i i i, I, I it's, it's probably not original to me but one, one of the ideas that i talk about a lot is is that you know soft, soft software is not about communicating with the computer it's compute about communicating with people so you know yeah. you write in order to be able to, you know if we were communicating with a computer we'd still be flipping switches on the on a panel somewhere you know so we write in order to be able to com communicate with other people. And I was trying to figure out whether that was, whether, you know, what you were saying was, was all of that or, 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 or more than that. And I think it's more than that. So, so the, you know, the, the other part of this, the, the, one of the ideas that, that I've become fairly addicted to recently is the, is the team topologies guys stuff in terms yeah. of talking about, you know, the, the you know the socio-technical design to try and facilitate sensible software development in in little groups um and all of these things come to play but as you say that they're, they're deeply human they're, they're deeply implicated yeah. in our ability to do that because because and i hate that. Us that does it it's us that does it i i i do and i don't but i i mean you know one of the things you know, one of the most underappreciated ideas that you introduced us to is pair programming for me anyway and you know that's one of the, one of the joys of a team that works using pair programming is how well you get to know your colleagues and like them or not you understand them better and they understand you better and you collaborate more effectively and you do better work you know lennon and mccartney wrote great songs because they worked together it, you know it wasn't it wasn't a solo endeavor and neither of them was quite as good alone you know so so i i, I think humans being creative and i think software is a deeply creative thing you know it's it's about this trying to facilitate ways of allowing people to interact and learn from one another and do interesting things together so sounds sounds yes sounds like a good place to start so so he, here's the the sequence i i, I don't know if the, you've had this experience when i start to write a book i always think oh there's not near enough scope here to <laughs> yeah. fill a book yeah. and then i get into it and i realize oh there's like 10 times too much scope for a book so let me chop it down and then I chop it down and I think, oh, there's nowhere near enough scope for a book. And then I start writing that. And, yeah. and then three, four iterations of that. And I finally have a book's worth of, of, of scope and yeah. a book's worth of writing. So yes. the way that worked for this topic is I started out wanting to, I want to address the, the challenge of delivering features to people who can't program. So this is about a power differential. Yeah. Pro programmers, the people I would call changers, the people who can change the code, have a kind of power in the relationship that the people who want the program to change its behavior, but can't facilitate, can't make it do that. And I call them the waiters. So we got waiters and changers. Yeah. And that's a fraught, that's business and technology. That's a fraught relationship. There's a lot of bad history, a lot of bad blood, very different perspectives. That's the relationship that I'd like to address eventually. But as I started digging into it, I realized I, I had a bunch of foundation stuff that I had to, yes. to lay first. So the first book is called Tidy First? Question mm mark. -hmm. And the uh, Technically, what it's about is you're a programmer, you look at some code, you need to change the way it behaves, but it's messy. Yeah. Do you tidy first? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. And yeah. the reasons why you might want to tidy first, tidy after, just let it simmer and tidy later 
I can pull in little bits and pieces of all this, the, the principles of software design, coupling, cohesion, power law distributions, uh, time value money versus optionality. I can pull in a little bit of that to illuminate this question that every programmer has to ask themselves 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the technical side of it. But the, the relationship side is what's your relationship to yourself? And programmers oftentimes have this kind of masochistic streak as like, oh, this code sucks and I hate yeah. changing it, but but I'm just going to go and do it. And it's painful and it's confusing and it causes a lot of anxiety and you don't really learn anything new, but you power through because you're a programmer. <laughs> and that's a dysfunctional relationship with yourself. So yes. tidying in the sense, this is software design in the micro, tidying yep. is an act of self-care. Yes. I'm worth it. I have to change this code. It's going to be scary, confusing, painful, expensive to change. So I'm going to address that before I change the code. And this is this distinction between structure and behavior. Here we're talking about let me change the structure before I change the behavior, which you do sometimes and sometimes yep. you do the other way around. But this is really about, are are you worth it? And the and I think the answer generally should be, yes, you're worth it. Does it mean you can go off on a, I'm going to tidy forever without changing the behavior? Yeah. That's at the, at the highest level, this waiter changer, relationship that doesn't work for that I'm, i will get to that first but for this first book tidy first this is really about your relationship with yourself and do you make things better do you have that habit of making things easier to change as you go along in the yeah. micro now i think that from that will emerge a lot of the larger uh themes yeah i think that makes you a better partner with the other people who also have to change this code. I think that makes you a better partner with the people who can't change the code, but need the system to change. Yeah. But first, I'm just going to focus on this one narrow question. So that book is almost drafted. Now I'll have a, a publisher to announce pretty soon. Should be out mid this year if everything goes cool. quick and quick and smooth. Uh, does that answer your question about no that no book? no no that's great that 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 that's great do, do you know do you know what the other two volumes are what the topic of the other two volumes are yet or is that is that also going to be explored is it oh I, I yes i know which means they're likely to change but yeah yeah, yeah. the this the second volume is is about uh geek to geek relationships right so you're calling an api that i provide and i want to change it we have a relationship problem. We don't just yeah. have a software design problem in the sense of, you know, what order are the, are the arguments and what are their types? We have a relationship problem because yeah. I want to change it, but does that bring value to you? Um, you know, how quickly does it bring value to you? How much pain am I causing you? If I want to change it, I need to take responsibility for the consequences of that change, which is uh, uh, what I think is the the unusual um, perspective on this. Yeah. Which has led me most recently, this is like uh, last week's idea, to thinking about responsibility, that principle in relationships and why is it important. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the that's the second book is this geek to geek relationships, and yeah. then the 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 third book in the trilogy will be between this waiter changer right yeah, relationship, yeah. Yeah, yeah. where the business they don't give a rat's about yeah. software design, or they think they don't, yeah. except they do because if you don't design, you know, if you don't invest in the structure of the software, they're going to be very unhappy. So they care about the software design, but how do you how do you use software to design to enhance that relationship and yes. how, how do you use a healthy relationship between business and technology to enhance the software design and that's where i want to get to finally but 
first we got to get okay with ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's fascinating, and, and there's the stuff that I've read um, that that's publicly available. So I recommend people go and have a look um, at, at at Kent's work in progress and sign up and subscribe for the the first book at least. Um, but but the stuff that I've read so far, there's, there's as ever from your work, there's lots of ideas that are popping up and making me think, you know, think about things and think harder about things. So, so, so th thank you for making it available. I, don't, I am really looking forward to that first book. <clears throat> well, I'm glad you find it helpful. Oh, it's great. Um, we probably should start uh, wrapping up at this point. Uh, is there anything else okay. that we should have talked about that you that you want to that you want to mention before we wrap up? It's okay if not. Nothing pop. Nothing popping right at the moment. Um, cool. uh, you know, I've always got. I have my list of topics here. These are all the books that I want to write. Yeah. Um, before I'm finished, and of course, when you write one, it spawns three three new ones. So. Yeah. I, I, yeah, anyway. I, I, yeah, I, I, I find I need to have a little bit of a break between books. I'm, I'm just, I'm oh, just sure. coming up, I'm just coming up to have a start on another one. But, uh, but well, <laughs> I, I haven't written a book for 15 years, so it's, yeah. it's kind yeah. of fun to, it's, to it, get back it, into it's this. Such a lot of hard well. work, but also such a lovely thing to do. I, I, the thing that you alluded yeah. to, which is that that idea of the way of you, you exploring your own ideas and just getting new insights into into the way that you think about things. It's a lovely thing. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So uh, it, no, uh, I I don't. I mean, try 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 stuff. Yes. That's the. <laughs> this is the, the, like that. That is the magic. Is is the that that people who know a lot have learned a lot, and the people who've learned a lot have just tried a lot of stuff. Yeah, and even if you don't know what you're going to get out of it the work will teach you the lessons you're ready for. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't have a better summary than that. Not today. <laughs> no, it's we'll a, that's, that that, that, that's a pretty good summary. I think. <laughs> well, Dave, what a pleasure talking with you. Uh, uh, it's been an absolute delight. And um, I'm, I, I've, I've been following your work for, for many, many years. And I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for the contribution that you've made because it's been a serious one, as I'm, I know you know oh, and everybody welcome. watching this knows too. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. If you've enjoyed the episode today, hit subscribe and like if you enjoyed the, enjoyed this too. Um, we'll put links to the stuff that Kent talked about uh, below. Do follow up, and I, I, I just recommend that you go and – have a have a look at his writing on design because I I think it's going to be important. I think it's going to help us think about things differently and maybe move on, maybe move on another step or two. So thanks everybody and bye-bye. <laughs>